there. Hi guys. Uh, welcome back. Today I've decided to talk about uh, nasal surgery. Um, I might have directed you to this video if um, you're somebody that I've talked about nasal surgery uh, or you may be curious about nasal surgery um, and want to know more. So hopefully uh, I can help anybody who's interested in knowing more about the surgery that ENTs do for the nasal airway. So I'm not gonna talk about specifically sinus surgery today. I'm going to talk about the procedures that we do to improve airflow through the nose, which is a slightly different thing. And if you wanna understand a little more about the differences between your nose and your sinuses, I do address that in my earlier video about the nose and sinuses. So today um, I'm going to talk about uh, a procedure called septoplasty and turbinate reduction. It's probably the most common procedure that we perform uh, in general ENT. And uh, we do it for uh, different reasons, but in the end, the cause, the, co the, the goal is always to improve the way that the air flows through your nose and into the rest of your airway. So uh, people that might come for this surgery would uh, complain of problems breathing through their nose, they might have um, trouble with snoring, which causes a turbulent, you know, that when the nose is tight or curvy inside, it causes turbulent flow and drains the uvula, so snoring may be a cause. Sometimes people just feel sort of extra snotty all the time because they, they, don't, they don't have enough room for the natural secretions in their nose. And sometimes the, uh, the nasal anatomy is actually obstructing the sinus outflow, resulting in more than the normal number of recurring problems with sinus infection and things like that. So those are really the reasons that uh, the, the, the reasons that we do the surgery and the people who come for the surgery. And uh, if you're one of those people, then let's talk about uh, some ways that we can help you. We end up doing a procedure when medical therapy doesn't work. So even if the anatomy of the nose is curvy or tight, we are obligated to try medical therapy first to try to soothe the nasal membranes, shrink them down, and create more airflow with medication to improve uh, the space in the nose so the air can flow. Now, if that doesn't work, uh, we are able to go ahead and do a procedure or procedures to improve the flow. And this is usually covered by your insurance. Um, it's generally considered a covered service. Of course, there's always, you know, often co-pays or co-insurance that patients are responsible for, but in generally it's considered uh, medically necessary. So that's nice that the insurance companies acknowledge that breathing adequately through your nose is a good thing. Um, the procedure is done in general in an outpatient surgical environment. So most of the time in our practice, we will do a light general anesthesia to do the procedure in an outpatient surgical center. So uh, an operating room with an anesthesiologist and nurses uh, to uh, help and monitor you while you are completely asleep for the procedure. Uh, in our group, it takes us maybe 20, 30 minutes to do the whole procedure. It's fairly short. And as I mentioned, it's one of the most common procedures that we perform. So we're all very experienced and facile uh, with the procedure. So the procedure itself to get uh, the air flowing better through the nose usually involves two parts. The first part is straightening the septum, which is the wall that runs down the middle of your nose on the inside. The septum is made of cartilage and bone in different parts, and we do actually, you know, trim, cut, move, remove uh, parts of the cartilage and bone on the inside of your nose. Um, People ask if, if I break your nose doing it, and I don't technically, usually when people say, do you break my nose, they're talking about you know the nasal bones on the outside, and we don't go anywhere near those bones. Those are simply the um, awning that supports the external structure of your nose, but the airflow, as you may have seen in my first video about the nose, actually flows through the nostrils and straight back into your head, so we're really dealing with the part of your nose inside. So that's called a septoplasty. And the second part is called a turbinate reduction. So on the lateral portion, the walls on the outside of the nose, on the, on, like towards your ears, that wall has spongy tissue that is the part of your nose that usually responds, like if you have a cold or allergies, uh, it swells up and makes you very stuffy. So that's a dynamic, spongy, pretty blood-engorged tissue 
uh, that responds to all kinds of stimuli, you know, allergies, sometimes other things like change in your posture. A lot of people get very stuffy when they lie down. Um, and so those tissues is often good to address them as well, to try to shrink them down, maybe create some scar in the tissue and make it so that they're less like spongy and stuffy all the time, sort of tighten them up. So that's the other way to create airflow through the nostril. So let's just go ahead and look at um, some diagrams of the anatomy that I'm talking about. So this is a diagram showing um, the internal parts of your uh, nasal cavity and your sinuses. And remember how I said before, the sinuses are really the areas uh, connected to the nose here and they don't receive airflow. The part of your nose that's really responsible for your airflow is the kind of first floor, like I talked about, the ground floor of the nose, um, where the air goes in the nostril and then straight back uh, into the throat and down. So the septum, which is the area I was talking about uh, first, is this part right in the middle. In this picture, it's running straight up and down. But oftentimes, people will have little deviations, we call them, little parts where the septum is crooked. So it may be leaning here and it might have a little pokey part there and then another little part here and then it comes in. So when the air tries to flow, it has to squeeze through these little areas of tightness and we experience that as nasal obstruction or stuffy nose. The way that we fix this portion of the nose is with you asleep, we go inside the nostril and make an incision in the area in the very front of the septum up and down along the along the um, mucous membrane and we actually raise the mucous membrane up off of the cartilage and bone structure we do the same thing on the other side so the analogy i use is like taking a sandwich and taking the two parts of bread and just moving them to aside on each direction so that you can address you know the quote unquote you know meat in the middle then we're able to sort of use sharp instruments to remove the spurs, trim the connection here, and leave, and you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe just file that down and leave everything straight up and down in the middle in terms of the structure. Then put the two pieces of bread back in the middle so everything lines up again like that, like that sandwich on its side. Then we use suture to quilt it all together so it's tight and straight and then we sew up the little incision in the front. So it's kind of like nothing ever happened in there. So that's what exactly what we do when we do a septoplasty. It's all done through your nostril. The uh, part of the nose that you see on the outside is never touched, so that when you recover from this procedure, there is no cuts, bruising, or swelling that anyone sees on the outside. In addition, because we use a quilting suture like this and also close the incision, there's no need to pack the nose to uh, push all these layers together like they used to do in the old days. Now, in addition to doing the septal part of the operation, we also do address the turbinates. So this is a picture of a head that's been cut in the other direction, kind of sliced between the eyes. And you can see the sidewall of the nose with the three lumpy ridges of tissue that we call the turbinates. And this is the diagram that I used in my earlier video when I talked about how this lower part of the nose is where all the air flows in your nostril and down your throat. So the inferior turbinate, which here says IT, this is the part that we address with the, um, with the turbinate reduction surgery. And the exact way that we do that is we make another incision over the anterior, the front part of the turbinate here, and create a tunnel. We actually use a little burrowing instrument. We create a tunnel underneath the turbinate, a little bit of a tunnel here. And so we leave all the skin over intact all around the edges. And then we use a, a little wand and the wand gets inserted into the tunnel. And at the tip where my pencil head is, there's a little hot, you can imagine like a little hot end, like a little glowing end. And we turn it around and we burn, we create like a spiral burn inside the turbinate so that the whole thing, uh, is going to develop into some t like some 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 tight scar tissue when it all heals. So some of the tissue gets ablated, which means it kind of just I don't know, kind of evaporates, and then the rest of it gets a little bit of a burn on the inside. Now, even though that sounds terrible, it's really not a painful uh, part of the operation at all because you don't have nerves on the inside of your turbinate. 
you may end up feeling this incision, but all of the burn that happens on the inside is actually painless. So when that heals, it's initially it's gonna swell up a lot, and, ha and during your recovery, you may have some stuffy nose, but then as the body turns all that into scar tissue, this turbinate is gonna shrink down, and the result is gonna be, again, more room for the air to flow around the turbinate. After you wake up from the procedure, you may notice that your nose is significantly improved right away. Some people, especially if the cartilage and bone in the middle of the nose is very crooked, will notice immediately that they have better airflow through their nose when they wake up in the recovery room. Unfortunately, over the next couple of days, the swelling may set in, which is a natural part of the healing process, and that benefit may go away for a while, as the healing process uh, continues and becomes the final healed result. In the end, the result that you should get should be just as good or better than what you experience when you wake up in the recovery unit. So the first few days after the procedure, we do expect people to have some bloody drainage from their nose. We actually don't pack the nose, as I said. We usually just put a little pad under the nose and kind of let it ooze a little bit onto the pad and then you change it every hour or two, whatever, and then it just stops and you don't need the pad anymore. Anybody seeing you without a pad on your nose would not know that you had any procedure done, except if maybe you sounded a little nasal like this because you were really stuffy. But remember, nothing on the outside which means that after the first day where we ask you to stay home and kind of rest because we don't want your nose to bleed, and maybe most or all of the second day, same thing. If you were to go out and you know go to the store or whatever, you could get back to the activities of daily living and you would not have any uh, reason that you couldn't you know just uh, even go to work as long as you had a job that wasn't incredibly strenuous. So we usually tell people that they need the day of the procedure and the next day off of work, that they should avoid something very strenuous for seven to 10 days because we don't want you to get a nosebleed. And also that you should expect to have mild to moderate pain. For the first day, I usually give people a few Vicodin to take um, just for the first maybe 24 hours. And honestly, some people don't even take the Vicodin at all. They just use Tylenol and they're fine. So it's not a very painful procedure. In terms of risks, um, there's about a 2% risk of post-operative bleeding. Um, so what that means is that sometimes a scab may fall off of the inside of your nose and we might have to bring you back either to our office or to uh, the ER and put a, a pack in your nose, um, which is usually like a spongy type or like a balloon type pack. Um, and that's uncomfortable and unfortunate. They often stay in for a couple of days. Um, but remember, that's only a 2% risk. So only two out of every 100 of these procedures ends up having to have that done. And lastly, the recovery after the first couple of days is usually sort of like, you know, having a cold. You basically have some stuffy nose. There's kind of a stuffy phase, you know, about four days after-ish. And then uh, for the next week or so, it can be stuffy because there's some sort of crusting in the nose that can develop some scabbing and things like that. It's kind of annoying, but that will all go away with time. Um, and as the nose heals, your airway gets better and better and better. And so um, by the time people are several weeks out from the procedure, they're just enjoying nice airflow through their nose and uh, no longer have any uh, reminders of the fact that it was done at all. So that is my explanation of septoplasty and turbinate reduction. Um, and uh, I have to say, you know, I wish I could have a patient on here to talk about how much uh, the procedure helped them, but uh, we have a really immense satisfaction rate with this procedure. Um, people tend to get permanent and lasting improvement in their nasal airway. And many people tell me that they wish they'd done it sooner. Um, so that's my, uh, that's my video about septoplasty. Any more questions in the, um, about the procedures is you can leave them in the comments. Um, and if you're considering the procedure, I strongly encourage you uh, to talk about it with your ENT doctor um, or you know, ask me any further questions if you're one of my patients. But hopefully this helps clarify things for you. Okay, bye-bye.